Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to West Meadows. Where we are on mission. Inviting people to experience new life with Jesus. Are you joining us for the first time? We're so glad you're here. We welcome you to this place, to this moment with us here today. We're so glad that you've chosen to join us for a time of worship through song. prayer, and teaching. This is West Meadows, and we believe that if you show up consistently, whether on site or online, that you will begin to see the amazing things that God can do in your life and the lives of those all around you. Morning. Join us as we sing songs about the birth of Jesus Christ. Sort of with heart the herald angels sing. Welcome, and we're so glad you're here today with us. Although we are online today, we can still feel the joy as we celebrate about the birth of Jesus Christ. And with that said, we hope you are enjoying your comfortable stay in your homes and Merry Christmas here from West Meadows. And, you know, it is a good news. So let's keep on singing. Let's share what the angels and the shepherds have shared that night as well. Because the birth of Jesus Christ is the good news. So let us go and tell it on the mountain. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain, 
Christ is born.
It's an exciting Christmas season. We've just celebrated with family. We've just sung songs of praise to our Lord Jesus. So now let's unite our hearts in a time of prayer with him as well. God, you are so, so good. You're a God who came down in the form of a baby a baby that is so exciting to us in this moment today because that baby is a sign of hope, hope of a future that is eternally with you. God, we thank you so much for that understanding, for sending your son to come and bring us hope. And God, as we look back on 2021, there were lots of ups and lots of downs and lots of in-between, but God, you were there through it all. Your presence was constantly surrounding us here at West Meadows and abroad. All those people that have walked through the doors or have tuned in online, God, everybody that is praying right now has been surrounded by you this year, and we are so, so thankful for that. God, you've given us strength in time of weakness. You've encouraged us when we've been discouraged. You are a never-changing God in an ever-changing world. And we thank you that we are able to weave you into our story so that others can see you through us, through that filling of the Holy Spirit in us that you've granted to us. God, all those things sound so lofty, yet they came through the form of a baby. So vulnerable, yet so, so powerful. You have bridged the gap, God. Help us to never forget that. Help us to look forward to being able to share you with others. God, we love you. You truly have poured every blessing into our lives. And we praise you always, in all circumstances. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, we are so glad that you've gathered with us here this morning. And so, like we usually do, we're going to ask for an offering. And so you can click that give button that's just above me right here. And we just encourage you to continue to give right to the end of 2021. So if you give an offering today, but right up till the 31st, it's tax tax deductible for this calendar year. So if that's you today, click that button. Um, But all of that giving goes towards our ministry here at West Meadows where we're able to impact the community around us, but also those that are here. And those are all different ways that people can experience new life. And so along those lines, we want to show you a few more ways that you actually can experience new life with us here at West Meadows. Welcome to West Meadows. My name is Zach, and we're so glad that you could join us. If today is your first time joining us, we're so glad that you're here and we would love to get to know you more and help to answer any questions that you may have through our Connect card. Simply tap the I'm new button in the chat or the Connect button right above me to access our Connect card. Also, if you're new to West Meadows, we would love to invite you to spend a lunch hour with us on Sunday, January 9th after service to discover West Meadows. Lunch is on us. This is a great chance for you to meet the staff, learn a little bit about West Meadows and what next steps are available for you. If you'd like to register or for more information, please visit our website. Before we hear a message this week, we want to let you know about two things coming up at West Meadows. Number one, if you haven't heard about it already, we want to let you know about Alpha. Alpha is an 11 week course that creates space where people can have open conversations about life, faith and Jesus. If you or someone you know is asking questions like, is there more to life than this? Who is Jesus? How can I have faith? Alpha is a great place to discuss and learn from others about life's big questions. If you or someone you know would be interested in attending Alpha, you can email thena at westmeadows.org or visit our website for more information. Number two, we'd like to invite you to an hour of prayer on January 4th at 7 p.m. Begin your new year with prayer and join the members of our board as they lead us to pray, praising, repenting, asking, and yielding to God. Feel refreshed as we enter this new year, encouraged and strengthened as we unify through prayer. We're so grateful for everyone that joined us at last month's hour of prayer, and we'd love to see you again, and maybe even bring a friend. If you'd like to attend, simply save the date, January 4th at 7 p.m., and we'll see you here at the church. In the meantime, you can find more information on our website. If you have questions about anything that I've mentioned, feel free to ask one of our chat hosts or reach out to us on Facebook. If you'd like to contact the church, the office will be closed until January 1st, but we'll do our best to stay in contact with you if you leave us a message or email. Now, let's hear this week's message. Well, good morning and happy Boxing Day to you. Perhaps you have been spending the last few weeks with us as we have been looking at Advent and speaking on the topic of hope. And if you have been participating with us, you've probably noticed some of Pastor Mark's incredible ugly sweaters, his Christmas ugly sweaters. (laughs) Well, I went searching for my ugly sweater and I couldn't find it anywhere in all of my Christmas boxes. It was nowhere to be found. So today, instead of wearing my ugly Christmas sweater, I am just dressing a little more casual because I am guessing that you too are a little more casual as we are not meeting in person but fully online today. I'm so very glad that you're participating with us and I'm so really very excited to be able to speak on the topic of hope. We've been talking about hope is here and today we are going to talk specifically about how hope is ours. So anytime I think of the word hope, I automatically start thinking about my roots because I was actually born in the town of Hope in British Columbia. And I heard not too long ago from somebody that we actually have lots of people who are listening and tuning in to West Meadows at home from Northern BC. Not that hope is northern BC, but it's BC nonetheless, so I just want to just kind of send a a shout out to all of you 
to everybody who's participating, wherever you may be from. Thank you for participating with us today. As we speak about hope is ours, I would like you to turn your attention to the book of John. And the first chapter primarily gives us a really good understanding about why hope is is ours. So I'm not going to read all of it for you, but I first of all want to provide you with a little bit of a summary. So we will kind of look at John 1 verses 1 to 16. And I will point out a few verses in a little more detail. We'll go into depth on how they might be about hope and why hope can be ours through what we learn about in scripture. But first of all, like I said, we'll just kind of go through a summary of the beginning parts of John. Now, This part of John can be a little bit confusing because there's two Johns that are involved. So, of course, we have the writer John, who is one of Jesus' devoted disciples and good friends. And then we also have John the Baptist. So John the writer is writing to us about John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is kind of, I guess, a nickname that we give him because, among other things, he was the one who baptized Jesus. So I'm a little familiar with the whole idea of being confused by a whole bunch of Johns because my grandpa Stuart, so my dad's dad, he had a habit of calling every single one of his grandchildren by the name of John. Well, almost all of them. There were a few that had these other special names, but for the most part, we were all John. So it could be very, very confusing. But now that we've just kind of made that clear to you that we've got John the writer who's talking about John the Baptist, let's look at what he is talking about. So hope is ours because God has come to dwell among us. And uh, some of you, if you're, I don't know, maybe a uh, young adult or a child or a teenager, you might be thinking, among us, this is interesting. I know that online game. I play that. I'm all ears. Well, we're not talking about that among us. We're not talking about, you know, the difference between the the crewmates and the imposters and trying to deduce who's here. Here, we are talking about God himself actually being among us. So, uh, John 1.14 says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So John the Baptist is talking to um, all of his people (laughs) about how there is a message to be given. God chose him as the messenger, and the message was Jesus is on his way. And this was a very important message because Jesus was the true light that would shine on the world. And some people accepted that message. They chose to embrace it, and they received him. And everybody, then and now, who does this, who chooses to trust in Jesus to save him, well, they are made a child of God. So every child of God gets a gift, and that's the gift of new life. And Christmas is the story of Christ becoming a human being to live on earth among us. And while he was here, he was also full of loving forgiveness and truth. He's also the one who's capable of blessing us with that loving forgiveness and that truth by piling on grace upon grace. So there's our summary. And as I mentioned, God being among us. Hope is ours because God came to dwell among us. And for the first listeners, as John was was writing this, as John was speaking this, this would have been absolutely shocking news. Now, the listeners, they would have been both Greeks and Jews. And John knew this. And so as he was writing his first chapter, he uses the word, word, capital W, word. Word, And this is a very important word because it means something special for both Jews and Greeks alike. It means something different, but still something very powerful, something very important. 
So John knows his audience. He's got Greeks. He's got Jews. He knows that word is a term that's meaningful to both of them. And now, let me give you a little bit of an understanding of what word means for the Greek and for the Jew. So for the Greek word with a capital W, that would include both spoken word and also an unspoken word. And so again, for the Greek, the unspoken word, that's what's still in your mind. That's reason. And when the Greeks would apply reason or this word to the universe as a whole, well, that meant that rational principle that governs everything. So whether it was a Greek or a Jew that was hearing John's statement, it was almost unfathomable to think that the word for the Greek, this rational principle that governs everything, or word for the Jew, which for them, word, capital W, that was Yahweh, that was God, that that word was all of a sudden living among us, living with them, And what was really exciting and also unfathomable for them is that this was in the flesh, the word here with us. This was not a hologram. For me, I think it was probably the first movie I ever remember going to. I can remember this this snapshot picture in my mind of lining up downtown Edmonton, and Star Wars was going to be the movie that we were going to be going to see. And you're probably familiar with Star Wars, whether you've watched one or all or none of them, but Star Wars has been around for a while. And how they work it in Star Wars is sometimes there will be a character who will speak to another character, sometimes from a galaxy far, far away. Sometimes the character is even speaking to them kind of from the underworld as if they had already passed away and yet they want to speak to one of the characters. And what's interesting is that although they have these conversations, they are not together with each other in the flesh. Now, we're not talking Star Wars or fiction, we're talking reality. And that's why this was just unbelievable for the Greeks and the Jews. This isn't a hologram. This isn't a ghost dressed as a person. No, this is incarnation. God has assumed a human nature, has become a man in the form of Jesus Christ. And what we read about here in John is that he was fully God and fully human. So I've told you a little bit about a movie that I once saw, like the Star Wars when I was little, but how about a a cartoon that I watched when I was young. I watched Hercules, and Hercules had this sidekick named Newton, and Newton was a centaur, and he was kind of a boy centaur, so he was boy on top and horse on bottom. He was 50-50, but here, no, he's 100% God and 100% man. And also in the verse, it tells us that he was full of grace and truth. And that means 100% as well. 100% grace, 100% truth. So on the topic of among us, my two children, they no longer dwell with us. My son lives in Manitoba. My daughter is in British Columbia. She's not in Hope. She's not in really northern BC. She's in Kelowna. She's going to college. And for most of the year, that means that they're far away from us. It means they're not among us. It means that in order for us to see each other, we would have to travel a distance. But when it comes to God, there's no pilgrimage that has to be made. He is among us. We don't have to travel anywhere. We don't have certain practices or or steps that we have to take. No, we don't have any rituals or, or things that have to happen, unlike so many other religions. In fact, all of the other religions. There's no list of things that must be accomplished in order to reach God. God has come to us. So right now, as it's Christmas time, I mean, it's technically still Christmas time, day after Christmas, right? We're still in the Christmas season. My family, we're reunited, so we are together again. And my children are among us, which is wonderful. Now, to be among someone is one of the the most special things 
It's one of the most relational experiences that you can have with somebody else. Because when you're together, you experience things together. Think of the senses. Think of, say, dinner. If you had Christmas dinner yesterday, or perhaps on Christmas Eve, and you're all together, and you taste the same foods, and you smell the same foods, and maybe, maybe you, you reach out and, and you touch the hand of the person beside you, or you tap the shoulder, pass the salt, or maybe you've embraced somebody because you haven't seen them for a while, or you're just so grateful to, to have time together with them in the holidays. There's that sense of touch. We're together. We're experiencing each other. And then the sense of hearing. You, you hear each other giggle at each other's jokes, you've chatted about things, you've conversed, you've said thank you for a gift or two, maybe you've even let out a burp, perhaps in appreciation of the meal, or maybe that's just a thing that you do. But you've heard one another as well. So when you reside together, sometimes that also means that you start kind of feeling each other's mood and, and presence and what's going on in each other's lives. For instance, let's say maybe there's a loss that somebody has had, and maybe this is not your personal experience or your personal loss, but you are among someone who has lost somebody, and you start to feel for them, and you have this shared experience with them. God made his dwelling among us. He feels for us. He's had shared experience with us. He shares in all of those experiences and cares so deeply for us. So I want to challenge you to think about this. Are you living your life as though God is among you? Or is it still as though he's far away? As though there's kind of a trek that needs to happen in order for you to reach out to him or him to reach out to you? Is it like he's on a mountain? Do you forget that he's right here among you? Hope is ours because he dwells among us. And hope is ours also because he has given us the right to become his children. So back to John, John 1 verse 12 says, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The right. Nowadays, it seems like so many people just feel like they have this entitlement, this, this right to a whole bunch of things. We feel like we should automatically receive something just because it's my right. But I question, is it your right? And what makes it your right? When my husband and I were traveling at the very beginning of our marriage, we decided that we were going to go over the border and do some traveling down into the US. And we crossed through the Peace Arch Crossing, which is in British Columbia as well. And at that time, there was something called the Pace Lane. And the Pace Lane was this pilot project that later became Nexus. So if you're familiar with Nexus, that's just kind of so that certain travelers, frequent travelers, have access to be able to cross the border in a quicker manner than somebody who does not have that access. So we are here at the border, and there are lanes and lanes of loads and loads of cars. And then there's this one lane that has no cars in it. And Matt was kind of thinking, hmm, okay, well, these lanes, they look like they'd probably take two hours to get across the border. But then there's this short lane right in front of me, I think probably five minutes, and I could be over the border if I take this lane. We assumed that we had the right to be in that lane. We did not have the right to be in that lane. We had no clue what the pace lane was. It just kind of looked like an open lane that was ready and available to us. The Border Patrol, they were not impressed that we were in the pace lane. We did not qualify for that lane. We had not done what needed to be done in order to travel along that path. We weren't eligible. There were things that had to be done. I mean, there was documents that would have had to have been gathered together. There's um, an application form to fill out, an interview to apply for, and then an interview to pass. We didn't have any identification that told anyone that we were able to be in this lane, that we had the right to be in that lane. 
yes, we were low-risk travelers. We had never had any kind of immigration violations or reasons that would make it that we maybe wouldn't be able to pass all of the, the features and, and, and things that needed to be accomplished in order to receive the right to go in that lane. But we had to go regular inspection. We couldn't zip through the fast lane because we didn't qualify for it. We didn't have the right to be there. So back to the verse, he gave the right to become children of God. And here, when we see that word right, it helps us to look at the Greek term for that. And that's exousia. And exousia indicates entitlement. This right that we have this entitlement, and it's extended to anyone and everyone who receives him. So believers, they receive spiritual entitlements, these honors, just because you're a member of the family of God. And there's all sorts of gifts. There's all sorts of purposes and, and callings and promises. There's even an eternal destination in the visible presence of a God in a resurrected body. And, I mean, if you look at this lengthy list, you might be thinking, who wouldn't want to sign up for that? But the sad thing is, is that a lot of people think that they just automatically receive all of the rights. And the reason is they either don't know, they don't care, or they just don't believe that they have a responsibility. But right in the verse it says, they must receive him and believe in his name. So you might be saying, great, that's me. <laughs> I've received him. I believe in his name. In this analogy, you could say, Nexus Lane, here I come, five minutes across the border. Woo-hoo! But I want to ask you, I want to challenge you. How are you doing with daily taking up your cross? How are you doing with daily renewing your appreciation for the Lord and for all of the things that he has done for you? So hope is ours because he dwells among us, because he's made a way for us to be heirs to his throne, and also because through him we have this constant, overflowing, limitless grace. So hearing those three things, you're saying, yep, okay, sign me up. Why isn't everybody? I'm thinking maybe this is one of those things where if it sounds too good to be true, maybe it is. <laughs> well, all of these things, God's with me. I can be his child. I can have grace upon grace upon grace. And it is great. But here's another caution. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a young German theologian, and he lived in the time of Hitler. And he greatly opposed Hitler's ideologies. And in fact, he was so much in opposition of them that he ended up being moved into an extermination camp. And in the extermination camp, he was executed for his beliefs and for his uh, just strong uh, ability to just lift Jesus' name high and to really um, not condone the things that Hitler was trying to get everybody to buy into. Even though he was uh, German, and he came from this, you know, wealthy family and everything else, he knew what was right to do, and he was not going to have comfortable Christianity. In 1937, just a few years before he was executed, he wrote a book, and it was called The Cost of Discipleship, and I said it was 1937, but to this day, this is one of the most important books that many theologians will go to, and what he talks about in in his book is a topic called cheap grace and I'm just going to share a, a short little quote from it cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance baptism without church discipline communion without confession cheap grace is grace without discipleship grace without the cross grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate so at Christmas time, it's really easy to just get all, you know, bundled up in this whole concept of Jesus the baby coming in swaddling clothes and all these wonderful things. But we mustn't forget, he arrived 
for us, to save us as our Savior. And when he was here, he carried a heavy weight, the heavy weight of our sin. He paid a great price. The cost was hefty. And for all that Christ did for us, what a spit in the face it would be to do the things that Dietrich Bonhoeffer is saying don't do, to say, I've sinned, to say everything's forgiven, I can stay just as I am, I can enjoy all the consolations of forgiveness. We can enjoy grace, we should enjoy grace, but we should never shy away from living sacrificially. We should never shy away from being ethically consistent. John 1.16 says, From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. I want to read that to you in the Amplified Bible version. For out of his fullness, the superabundance of his grace and truth, we have all received grace upon grace, spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing, favor upon favor, and gift heaped upon gift. Gift heaped upon gift. I love that word picture, especially with Christmas just being yesterday. I think about Christmas at my parents' place and how exciting it is when each of us brings the gifts from our homes that we want to bless our families with, and then we just start piling them up under the tree. And so mine go there, and then my brother's, the gifts that he has, and my sister's, the gifts that she has, and my parents' gifts, they were already there, and it's just gift heaped upon gift upon gift. And I have to say, I wouldn't say that necessarily any of us deserve the gifts that we're receiving from one another, The definition of grace is being given what you don't deserve. You know, grace upon grace, that's continuous. That's overflowing. It's never exhausted. There is no limit to it. God's grace knows no interruption. It is constant. It is an overflowing gift. And God's grace upon grace, it does three things. It rescues us, it honors us, and it changes us. So how does it rescue us? Well, because of his grace, he provided this plan of salvation. John 3.16, he sent his son, sacrificed him, and that is a rescue for us. And God's grace, it also honors us. And how does it do it? Well, just by lavishing on, you know, all of those wonderful gifts of God that we receive. Lavishes us with privilege upon privilege as his children. And his grace changes us. We receive grace upon grace as God continually makes us more and more like him. So we're changed from who we were to more and more like him, we have this new life. Our old self, it's replaced with a new self. And our new self is a reflection of Jesus. And that's all because of his grace. So if you think of the gift that keeps on giving, my friend gave her husband yesterday a special gift. It was a six-month coffee subscription. So here's, you know, gift upon gift upon gift, the gift that keeps on giving for six months anyway. My husband once gave me a gift that keeps on giving. He gave me a lifetime subscription to Sirius satellite radio. And that was a great gift. I love music and it's so fun to just be able to kind of peruse through the channels and there's also some good kind of talk radio on there and really it it has anything and everything that a person might want to listen to as far as genres of music go and topics. It's wonderful to have that and to know at my fingertips for a lifetime I have access to that. But what would be even better than that. Think about maybe, what about if you had the opportunity to have 
unlimited access to your favorite concerts. You could have VIP passes, you could have the best seats in the house, you could have whatever you wanted to be signed by your favorite musical artists. You could choose your favorite drummer's drumsticks or your favorite guitarist's prized guitar. How about if you were to get music lessons from your favorite musician. I mean, I think about my grandma. She loved Pavarotti. And what would it be like if my grandma could just dial up Pavarotti any time that she wanted and could have said to him, hey, how's about you come on over and we can have a concert. It will be at this time, at this place, and these are the pieces that I would like you to sing. I mean, doesn't that sound overwhelmingly, abundantly amazing? This unlimited access, these privileges, this is what it's like when we have our life with Christ. So now that we have this abundance of grace, what are we going to do with all of that grace? Well, 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8 says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Through his overflowing grace, God can enable each of us to just abound in generous deeds. Deeds, that's benevolence. So why not be benevolent? Why not pay it forward? You've received so much grace. God has been so gracious and loving and wonderful to you. Why not give back? Give a gift that keeps on giving to somebody else. Hope is ours. So I want you to just live with the knowledge that Jesus is right here with you. And if you haven't yet accepted that opportunity, if you haven't yet called upon him and became a child of God, then I beseech you, do not delay. Don't delay. There are so many privileges to be had, and those privileges, they last more than a lifetime. They are eternal And just as the Lord has privileged you with those wonderful things, you have the opportunity to privilege other people because he's given you the gift to be able to pass that on. So each day we can be filled with hope because Jesus, he came to live among us. He came to make it possible for us to be children of God and all who are in his family. We are all so graciously blessed. We have received this long list of blessings from God. And through the power of Christ, we also can bless others. So what are we talking about here today? Hope is ours. Dear Lord God, we are so grateful that hope is ours ours. We are so grateful, God, that you have made it possible for us, Lord, that you have blessed us with grace upon grace upon grace, that you have made it possible for us to know you, for us to be loved by you, for us to be embraced by you, that you dwell among us, that you live with us. We love you, God, and we are so grateful for you and your glorious, kind, caring, wonderful joy. We have hope because of you. Amen. Sing joy to the world. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let us
hearts in joy. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let men songs and glory. He comes to make His blessings flow. Heaven and nature sing. so happy that you are here today with us to celebrate his birth and today as we close if you are in a place right now and you feel like you're you're not feeling that joy or hope and you need someone to pray for you feel free to press that prayer button on the top here or somewhere here I'm not sure where it is on a live stream but it will be in there and then someone will be will be happy to talk to you and chat with you and just like as we said from West Meadows to you we wish you a merry merry Christmas and we hope to see you here next year. <laughs>